Ha, gotcha. All right, anyway, now, so, anyway, welcome back, AP. Pope Paul, we're going <laughs> to... We're going to start off with where we left off in class, all right? So when we left off in class, we were talking about, notice I'm just shotgunning straight into this, because I don't want you to have another 20-minute guy, all right? I'm going to try to keep this one like 12, maybe 11 minutes, so. But anyway, in class, we were talking about the Catholic Counter-Reformation, right? We also were talking about the fact that Eastern Europe was like a grab bag of different faiths, right? Where you have that, like, that last note where Eastern Europe was like a mix of all the different faiths, the big ones that they were a mix of was... Calvinism, Lutherans, Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox, right? So anyway, and that's all from the Great Schism back in the day in the Byzantine Empire. But Pope Paul is going to call the Council of Trent, right? Remember, he came in with all these great ideas. He's like, let's outlaw pluralism. Let's help to educate people. Let's uh, outlaw pluralism. Uh, no, but he also had a lot of other things as well. He wanted to try and actually go after doctrinal heresy, not necessarily heretical acts like, oh, well, you know, uh, the church isn't being nice. He wanted to stop doing that, right? So he calls the Council of Trent with the Council of Cardinals to try and make it possible where they're going to actually create a new Catholic system, right? And this right here is actually a picture of the Council of Trent. They met several different times from 1545 to 1563, and they had a lot of successes, right? The big successes that the Council of Trent under the Council or the Counter Reformation is going to have is the fact that they're going to make indulgences illegal. That's a big one, right? So anyway. The fact that indulgences and now buying your way out of sins is going to be made illegal. They're going to reject the idea, though, of salvation by faith, okay? Salvation by faith is a Lutheran idea, so they're going to reject the ideas that you all you need to do is have faith in God, and then you'll be able to actually get exempt from his judgment, right? So they're going to reject that idea. However, they're also going to acknowledge the corruption of the clergy. Remember when we talked about that in class today? Also, underline Council of Trent or highlight it. It is super ridiculously important. They ask about it on every A-B test every single year. They harp on this, and they also harp they harp on the Counter-Reformation. So highlight Counter-Reformation, too. And they also harp on uh, the English Civil War, which is a big one. I actually like talking about that a lot. So, But they're going to reject the idea of salvation by faith. They're going to also acknowledge the corruption of the clergy. That was Paul's big initiative. But Paul III's big initiative was like, we're going to like acknowledge the fact that we were wrong, right? So the other one is they're going to work to fix that, though. The women are also going to be brought in to help educate. Nuns as well as lay women are going to be brought in to help create Catholic schools and things like that. So also they're going to create new orders, right? New orders of monks. Franciscan monks would be officially recognized. They're also going to bring in the Ursuline nuns and the Jesuits, right? So failures, though, of this council, unfortunately, it did not attempt to reconcile with Lutherans. It just acknowledged that they exist, right? If the Council of Trent would have made a very progressive step, they would have reconciled with the Lutherans and been like, hey, everybody loves God. We're just going to do it in different ways, and we can be peaceful with one another, right? Unfortunately, that didn't happen, right? So they only acknowledged their existence. So going forward, though, we've got to talk about a couple new orders, right? So the major goal of these new orders is going to be the education of priests and the education of people. So both of these new orders are going to be started in the idea of education, right? Circle education right there. Oh, put like a division sign above it, and then like a little globe, and then like a smiley face, and then like a heart. You know what I mean? Like education was huge according to these new orders. Also, it's genius when you think about it because it's also very politically schemed, right? If you promote education, you can also bring in more converts of other places outside of Europe, right? Go to like Japan, for example, where some of the uh, Jesuits went. India, parts of Africa, and begin to spread the faith via education, right? So the Ursulines, though, were actually an order of nuns that were added. Order of nuns founded by Angela Merici, right? An Italian monk, or nun. And they concentrated on the education of young women to raise the collective intelligence of households. They believe that if we have smart mothers, we will have smart children, right? That's an Ursuline nun. There's actually a very, very famous private school, St. Uh, it's like St. Ursuline School down in New Orleans. I actually like walked around the campus while I was there. So the Ursuline nuns are going to believe that everyone should have an educated household. The Jesuits are then going to come in as well. The Jesuits are really cool. Founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola, right? Called the Society of Jesus. So St. Ignatius of Loyola was actually originally a military man, right? He was actually an originally... Oh, sorry about that. He actually originally was involved in several different wars, right? In some of these wars of religion as well. 
He encourages the education above all, helps spread Christianity and humanist thought all over the world, right? He believed that spreading the ideas of Christianity along with the Renaissance ideals of the humanist world, it's going to go to places like Japan, India, Brazil, North America, the Congo, right? He's going to use these ideas and try to spread education everywhere. The really fun thing that I like about the St. Ignatius of Loyola was his exercise program. So he was actually, here's a picture of him right here, St. Ignatius of Loyola, when he was a military man, was actually very, very fit. But what's going to happen, he's going to be injured in battle, right? And while he was laying there on bed and he wasn't able to work out like he wanted to, he came up with an educational exercise program concentrated around the church. Like, say, oh, i got to do three sets of ten Hail Marys. Right? Let's rep them out. So anyway, the exercise program he came up with, Francis would agree. Why would Francis agree? Because our Pope, my man, he's a Jesuit, right? So... The Pope of the Catholic Church is a Jesuit. I know some of you are saying, my man, you weren't it. You're not even Catholic. You're right. But I appreciate the dude. And I also appreciate the Jesuit order in general. The uh, St. Joe's Prep, Jesuit order. St. or Loyola of Maryland, Jesuit order. Loyola of Marymount, Jesuit order. All of these places are Jesuit schools because they harp on education. Education, right? Educate the people. Make them smarter, and they will actually be more inclined to go towards God, right? So, genius. So, anyway, now we got to get into religious warfare, right? We are going to stop in a minute, not yet, though, because we got to get into talking about a couple of different things, right? But religious warfare is a big one. So, following the end of Charles V and his conflicts in Europe, right? Following the end, or following the Peace of Augsburg, okay? War is going to begin to break out amongst a lot of these new sects of Christianity, all right? And a lot of it has to do with the fact that nobles are choosing, choosing Protestant faiths so they have the ability to actually rebel against their monarchies, right? So here we go. The big one, oh yeah, the agents of Satan. That's actually what many of the, uh, many of the monarchs are going to refer to a lot of these nobles that are actually flipping sides and going Protestant, refer to them as the agents of Satan, right? So and that's what they actually are going to use as provocation to go in and stop a lot of these rebellions, right? Well, the biggest example of religious warfare occurred in France, right? So under Francis I, right? He's the guy that would, number one, spend ridiculous amounts of money on places like this, which was actually the palace that came before Versailles, and then also, you know, housing Leonardo da Vinci so he could suck his dying breath out of his face, all right? So remember I told you that story? Leonardo da Vinci was like sitting there and he like let out his death rattle and Francis first went and like sucked it in. That's where that's him doing it right there. That is so gross and weird. Now, anyway, though, he also is the guy that the Cellini salt cellar was made for, right? So Cellini salt cellar, the $60 million salt shaker, was made for Francis the first. So he's super Catholic. But his big thing was all about raising revenue. Right? So he wanted to actually raise the wealth of the monarchy to grow its power. Okay? So according to Francis I, the reason why nobles have power is due to the fact that they have land and money. Right? So his big thing was, I'm going to raise revenue. The way I'm going to do that, I'm going to start selling public offices. Right? So he's, for example, is going to offer up the ability to be amongst his higher robe nobles, right? He's going to start selling offices like magistrate offices. He's going to sell offices like uh, like commissioning offices, right? The problem is, though, you're kind of an idiot, and this is a dumb idea because you can't tax them after they've been sold, right? So you can't tax the office after it's purchased, right? So it was a flat rate that he ends up getting. Also, he's going to have a very good raising revenue idea, though, he actually creates a treaty with the Pope so he can also begin to appoint his own church officials, right? The great thing about appointing his own church officials means he gets a cut of the old famous 10% income donation that everyone is supposed to give to the church, the tithe, right? So make sure you write that down. Like, uh, began to skim the tithe off the top or began to collect tithe money as well as a way to raise revenue. He also, though, kept around a very, very old school tax that the French had had for a long time on salt and land. Right? So, like, he actually raised the money on that. Result, though, no need to revolt against Rome. So, he's the big reason why France stayed Catholic. Right? So, France is going to stay super Catholic because of Francis I. Okay? So, there goes my phone. Hopefully, it didn't break. All right. Anyway, now, he's going to say, keep them from going Catholic, though. But then here come the Huguenots. Right? So, 
Basically, the Huguenots are the brainchildren of Calvin, right? So when John Calvin started Calvinism out in Switzerland, remember, he originally came from France, okay? Well, the Huguenots are going to be like the children of his ideas. They're French Calvinists, right? They believe in not wearing boisterous garb. They believe in not drinking. They believe in not having theater. They believe in a lot of different things. But the funny thing about it is they actually didn't believe in it as much as they pretended to. Because one out of every ten French were converted to Calvinism, had converted to Calvinism or being a Huguenot by 1560, which was actually marked by the death of Henry II, French king, right? So Henry II was actually in a jousting competition, which actually carried over for quite some time following into the Renaissance, which I was actually really surprised, for, uh, surprised of when I actually read that. So guess what ended up happening to, uh, to uh, Henry II, though? So guns had been invented by this point, and they were having shooting competitions now at jousting and like big events and stuff like that. So he actually gets in, ends up getting shot in the face and then ends up dying in a competition. <laughs> so the French king ends up dying in competition after being shot in the face or stabbed in the face. I got to look it up, but I'm pretty sure it's shot in the face. So, But no one cares about him, mainly because... The absolute blitz for the, the offices in France are going to happen following his death anyway. Because it's all about his wife. His wife is the coldest woman in European history. Catherine de Medici. All right? So if you've ever seen Rain, you know who this person is. Haley, I know you're freaking out right now. All right, so anyway, now, like, so... Catherine de' Medici is seriously probably the most cruel woman in all of history and or one of the most cruel like not even like cruel women but like cruel people in like the dirtiest move I've ever heard all right so remember though Henry II the king of France dies in a competition right he either gets shot or stabbed in the face I gotta double check and look it up but he does die and the reason why that's so important is because now the throne is empty and it's being held by Catherine. So she now has to replace him because according to an old French thing called Salic Law, right? Let me write that up here. Salic, Salic Law says that the throne cannot pass to a woman in France, right? The Third Secession Act of 1543 in, in Europe, or excuse me, in England, is actually going to be the reason why Salic Law did not carry over in England, but Salic law was still a thing on the books inside of France, okay? So according to Salic law, a woman could not inherit the throne. So Catherine de Medici could not actually inherit the throne. She had to take their one daughter, Margaret of Valios, and marry her off to someone else, a French royalman, right? But the problem was, is a lot of our nobles are converting to being Huguenots, right? So, who? We'll talk about the backsplash, the backsplash, the backfire of this entire situation tomorrow. All right. Hope y'all had a great evening. Enjoy it. Right. Make sure you didn't mute me. All right. I'm going to even write it here. Don't mute. All right. Because if you do, you're going to miss a lot of stuff that was very important. Tomorrow, I'm also going to try and give you your study guide as well for this unit. Deal? But I will see y'all then. Have a great evening.